Good Good afternoon and welcome to Reading Swizzle. In this podcast, we share different ideas for educators and taxpayers and parents to consider and swizzle around. Today, I am very pleased and happy to present Dr. Joseph Moyer, who is an institutional and corporate diversity leader with Systemic Diversity and Inclusion Group. He is also an author. Welcome, Dr. Moy. Thank you so much, Mary. How are you? I'm very well. Will you tell the audience what is SDIG, System Systemic Diversity and Inclusion Group? Well, that's a long story, but let me summarize it this way. Um, I've been really privileged, as I tell people, that I was brought up by um, parents who were aware of exposure, giving me the necessary exposure I needed to know about the world. During my um, elementary days, I've had people from different parts of the world. One that reminds me quite vividly, Dr. Walker, who was my physics professor, who taught me physics. And uh, I don't need to go too long, but the man was extraordinary. And he was a family friend too from Canada. I had the privilege of having teachers from different parts of the world. So as I was growing up, I didn't have conception of, uh, you know, black, white, this and that. I was just, uh, you know, seeing human beings as human beings. So when I finished school, I had the opportunity to go to Britain for a very short time period. And then I came to Pennsylvania, I went to Pennsylvania for my undergraduate and, uh, you know, so that's uh, essentially it. And uh, the, that particular exposure to different people around the world um, enabled me to seamlessly make friends with people from various parts of the world. So when I was at in Indiana University of Pennsylvania, people would ask me, why do you have all these friends? They're always around you and they always like you. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I like them. Perhaps that's why. So when I went to school, I went to school. I went to school after I, I you know, went to teach at Illinois State University, where I taught for quite a number of years. And during the time I was there, I started the first international organization um, for students. And that organization, you know, sort of expanded and we have people from Japan, people from Europe, people from Africa, people from South America. And we were all, you know, we had fun, we played together, we, you know, so from that vintage standpoint, I got a sense that, I mean, I had already had the sense that human beings are by nature human beings and good people are everywhere. And sometimes some people may say people are not good, but is they, they are not being open and it's reciprocal. So, and at uh, Illinois State, that program I developed uh, stayed with me. So when I came to teach, um, when my wife had some me medical issues, I came here to work as a professional development for professional teachers. Um, during the course of doing that, um, I was able to train on diversity. And my, my, um, my dissertation was actually on policies and practices on issues of diversity. And that when I uncovered that sometimes people talk about diversity and when you go to it, they don't even know what it means. Uh, people don't even have policies to say, this is what they're talking about, which is an uh, antithesis for educational requirement for things like that. So from there, that's where I kind of, um, started this uh, diversity training. I was doing consulting. I was helping people, corporations to chatter the, you know, find ways to bring people together and develop a sense of belonging among all the people. Research shows that diverse organizations tend to be more productive than others. And I, I'm, I'm not surprised because they, they generate new ideas, innovate more, be more creative because one idea may come from God knows where and the other may come from the other one. And when they merge, you find better results. So that's essentially why uh, SDIG is now a global organization. We have people from all over the world. And I, I'm always proud to say that uh, 
uh, we have all the continents represented. I uh, can't think of any country that is not part of SDIG. Wow. So that's, 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 the, that's uh, the story. <laughs> that's really incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit about the book that you authored, and I am ordering off Amazon. Tell us the title and, and just a little gist about uh, what people will learn. Well, the book, this is the book, uh, you know, it's um, Cultivating a Belief System for Peace, Equity, and Social Justice for All. And the book stemmed from my... Um, my experiences, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, people may be shaped to believe in something. And when they believe in something, that's what would drive their behavior. Um, I read a number of books. I had uh, done some work with uh, um, schools where I took people from rural schools, say for instance, West Liberty State, uh, colleges in West Virginia, it's now West Liberty State University. I did what I call urban seminar. I picked students who were graduating to be ed educators and put them in urban area, such as Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, where they sort of, uh, uh, they don't go there and live, they go there and stay, work with the students there. And in, in Philadelphia, most of the students were um, Hispanic uh, people from South America, different countries, of course, and African Americans, and so many other people. So my students, when they go there, that's the people who are doing their practicum. It went from, why are these kids doing this? After the first two days, it becomes, that's my kid. Now, when you compare the difference between when they were saying, why are these kids doing this? and to the point where it became, that's my kid. You see the kind of relationship that began with students. The, the, the people I had there in Philadelphia, they really made me proud. They took these uh, kids from urban area, black and Hispanic kids, and began to treat them like as if they are their own. Mm -hmm. You can see that those kids, uh, really respected them even more than their teachers who were then my cooperative teachers. And it was really, uh, I was very impressed. So I do believe that the problem we have is a, as a result of lack of engagement, connection, relationship. So this book stems from um, my work over the years, the, the belief that People may have developed certain beliefs that may be inconsistent with how we need to behave and deal with one another. So the tenant of the book is to show how such individual can be transformed mm. into becoming the authentic person they deserve to, to be and be able to see other people, be able to help other people, be able to see themselves in the shoes of others. So the book, actually, I dedicated this book to two of my students over there in, in, at, um, who were at um, um, West Liberty University. They usually say that I, I really impacted them the most. Uh, one was a black, uh, a black guy, and the other one was a white guy. And the, the black guy, when he was coming to school, he continuously being stopped. And the white guy would say, Oh, don't mind him, he's a lazy person. I said, well, let's try. And uh, he went to check. Lo and behold, as he was coming, speeding, he saw the guy and stopped. And then he went to the police and came back. And then from there, things, they became friends. But to cut the long story short, the white guy, Bruce Mel, um, he, he went to South Carolina to teach. The very week he was supposed to join me at Illinois State was the week he hung himself. They say mm -hmm. it had to do with a, a you know, um, girlfriend, but I just a very, very painful experience. So I dedicated this book to him, um, you know, um, Bruce Mill. So that's how I got to this book. And the book is essentially on transformational processes. 
somebody may be groomed by someone who may have a cultivated the idea that certain people are less or certain people are more. And you can't divorce that from that individual. I sort of used the guy that went to South Carolina and killed nine innocent people of all the places at the church. Now, when I read everything the guy wrote, which wasn't very much, but the one was, he was a, a self-dubbed white supremacist. And when you look at his life, you find out that he's, you know, the kind of things that uh, happened to him. Then when you contrast him with somebody else who had a whole, uh, similar background, and this guy, his name is Derek Bell, whom I, everybody knows now, he's a lawyer by now. Um, when he was growing up, his parents thought that uh, he, he shouldn't be taught by any person of color. So they pulled him out from elementary school at a very young age and you know, educated him at home. I must say that they did an excellent job. The guy was like a sponge, well-spoken, very articulate. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the, that particular belief system they cultivated in him drove him to live double life. When he began college, he realized that the people he trusted were mostly the Hispanic people, the Asian people, the Black people, the people that the parents didn't want him to have anything with. But um, as things usually happen, um, he was living double life. On one hand, he was doing podcasts that was uh, sent to Eastern Europe and the, here in the United States uh, for white remesses. And on the other hand, he had to befriend the people who are truly his friends. So he was living double stand, double life that uh, you know, like that, which uh, fits into what Du Bois uh, characterized as, uh, um, you know, uh, double, you know, kind of trying to live two lives at the same time. And the, the, to cut his story, to cut the story short, he was transformed by those people whom he considered as his good friend because they confronted him. And when they confronted him, he left the school, finally came back, he graduated. And when he finished, he worked for um, Poverty Law Center in, uh, in Alabama. And wow. now he's a, a lawyer, very prominent attorney, and he defends equal rights for people around the, the world. And uh, he's just brilliant, very brilliant. In fact, I was reading his, uh, his, um, you know, his articles and uh, his book, and he's just phenomenal. Wow. So that's how the do come to. So it's essentially it's showing how people can transform from whatever the situation they found themselves to a better situation. And yeah. you know, that's essentially the, the book, whether it's gender issue, racial issue, or you know, neurodiversity related issues, or any of those issues uh, we are dealing with in, in today's world. Beautiful. Will you, show us, will you show us the book cover? Oh, right here. It's Beautiful. Okay, and I will uh, attach the link for that book uh, to this um, to this video and podcast. Oh, no problem, Mary. Thank so this, you. <laughs> this is such a great uh, segue into the topic for today. And um, as you know, I'm I'm really focused on literacy equity so that we can have literacy for all. And uh, so I have a couple of questions for you, but I think it might be interesting to people to know that there's not a single mention of, of education at all in the US Constitution. And so this is why perhaps we have 44 million people who are low literate and illiterate today. Um, I just started working with a wonderful woman in Cleveland and volunteering, and she is just learning to read, but she's 53, and she's doing quite well. Uh, she is African-American, and uh, I don't know what happened that, um, you know, she wasn't educated properly in our schools, 
But this is this is really a thing that bothers me, uh, Dr. Moe. And, and so I'm wondering, because you work in these circles, should literacy be considered a civil and legal right? Well, you know, we are at the time where legal issues, everything is legal, but again, there's a saying that goes, you cannot legislate morality. Hmm. And I, I would say that it should be civil right, it should be meant to, you know, but again, it wouldn't be, it's kind of this, my position on that would be, I can't say that it's gonna be Blego because there are some people who cannot really read due to cognitive problems. There are some people who can, and for those who can, and we deny them the access to reading, something would have to be done about it. And for those who can't, just because of their special circumstances, I think those people should be, uh, should be nurtured, should be supported in every way possible. Um, but again, the legal, making it a civil issue, I, I mean, I, I, can, I, can, I can support people who advocate for that, especially for those whose, um, whose kids are intentionally not well-trained, whether it's because of politics or because of teachers that don't have responsibility or for those who may purport themselves to be leaders in education, when in fact they are not doing much. Um, it reminds me of uh, uh, Jonathan Kuzo. Jonathan Kuzo is a famous American educator whose parents had wanted him to do, you know, the, the either law or, or, um, or uh, you know, medicine. But he went to school and started teaching little kids. And his statement was, he couldn't believe when we when he got to this uh, um, kindergarten class and these creatures, he called them precious creatures. He didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> but he, he loved them. And from there on, he knew that teaching is his call. Now, he wrote a book that was a book they called Savage Inequality, where he documented horrible things that are ha happening to some people, either because of poverty or because of a system of uh, inequity, where you, where you can see two communities divided by a river. Or by uh, you know, uh, or by road. One is where you have everything you need, and the other is where you don't even have toilet tissues in their bathrooms. And when you compare these uh, schools, it's uh, very depressing. And um, so, from that vintage standpoint, I think that if I were to be making decision, I would say that we are people intentionally impede the success of people from reading, they should be punished with the greatest severity. And where an individual can't because of circumstances that is beyond his or her control, um, I don't think that would, people should take them legally. So um, from that vintage standpoint, that's how I would, I would see it. But uh, the bulk of my uh, blame would be on the side of the administrators. Because last time I checked, they said that uh, um, principals are instructional leaders. They should know better. They should know the science of reading. They should know what it means. And they should teach students appropriately. You can't have kids who cannot read because they were not taught right. And exactly. science is clear as to how best to teach or teach reading. And even if people get into the murky uh, side, when I was looking at the, uh, the, the, the article, where it's just, you know, kind of wishy-washy, either that it's not direct or you say, well, balancing, what does that mean? 
Uh, there's a science way of teaching. That's what I think people should embrace and they should train accordingly. You can't go to medical doctor and say, look, um, if, they, if this is what medicine, this is what science says about this kind of uh, medication, or you go and do something contrary to that. So going to educators and, you know, seeing them not doing it right, according to research, which is ubiquitous, is wrong. We should adhere to the science of teaching, reading, so that everyone could be able to read. And of course, those who cannot read, um, then we can nurture them to the best of our ability to make the best of their lives. I couldn't agree with you more. And I'm so glad that you repeatedly said science of reading because we know so much more now. My, in, in doing some research for this uh, discussion, I realized that there have been so many court cases. So I'm not a lawyer, but in 1973, the United States Supreme Court first ruled on the right to education in San Antonio versus Rodriguez, holding that education was not a fundamental right under the United States Constitution. So we have this decentralized problem where it's up to the states and the states are, the states have to ensure a free appropriate public education for everyone, but it's pretty unclear uh, what, what that should look like. And it's, and it's very, very um, nebulous because like, as you described, you could be on this side of the river, river or the other side. Um, in that case in Texas, the school district relied heavily on property taxes. So of course, you know, children in a wealthier neighborhood were getting a far superior education. Uh, this district, you know, the, in this in this suit, they struggled to find the funds to uh, to fund education. So the parents argued that education is an, a fundamental right, uh, and therefore the Fourteenth Amendment prohibited the existing tax-based financing plan in Texas. Uh, unfortunately, Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell uh, wrote for the majority stating that education is not a fundamental right granted to individuals by the Constitution. Um, the majority's opinion was predicated on the fact that education was not mentioned in the US Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Uh, but notably in the dissent, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall noted that everyone should have the right to an equal start in life and that education is fundamental to that process. Justice Marshall continued by saying uh, that education is related to constitutional values and it's necessary to practice your constitutional rights. Um, so he also wrote that, you know, people can't exercise their First Amendment rights if they don't have basic literacy. So with his dissent, Thurgood, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall opened the way for future arguments about education as a fundamental right um, by the Constitution. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I you know as I had indicated, um, I think uh, education is very, very fundamental for democracy. Um, Thomas Jefferson made similar statement about the importance of education for the populace in order to have a democratic government. Um, the, the, the system is something I think is broken. If you go to those who may argue that, uh, you know, state rights, state rights are used to, to support something that I think is unsupportable. It's used to divide 
um, if you go to the election, I believe 19, 1872 or 74, when the, 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 the Republican was given the, the, the presidency, um, it's again, the same thing that propelled the, the, the division we have today. The Southern side will say they have this and the other people will say they have this. So the coming to education, saying I think is the 10th amendment, which says that anything that is not reserved for the federal government goes to the state. So it goes to the state. So the states can then do whatever they, 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 they decide to do. And that's why we have all this division and it has a, if a, 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 some of my students complained, one of my students actually said that her parents happened to be upper middle class and they lived in a particular neighborhood which she couldn't live in. But she had kids. And so she had to take the kids to her parents so that the kids can go to good school. Mm -hmm. And they say she couldn't if they uncovered that she was uh, misplacing them. I'm like, why would, they, why would there be division to such an extent that you can divide parents and, and their daughter or their children? Um, it goes to the heart of the, the issue, inequity. That's right. If if the issue of inequity is resolved, as you mentioned, school funding, I wrote a report uh, during my graduate work on school funding. It's devastating. It's horrible. There's no way to defend it. Um, Gozo, in his book, he talked about um, New Jersey, the eastern side, and the, you come to Washington. The, he, he used New Jersey. Washington, uh, St. Louis, uh, the area of um, um, New York, he used the five constituencies to, to, to work on that book. And each side, you see the division, the poor versus the rich. And the poor are people who are not really getting the type of education they deserve. I was reading the article where he stated that 85% or so people in jail cannot read. And then you went for that to say, how many of them who, when they come back, they have to go back. Mm -hmm. Mostly those that go back are those who were not taught how to read. The waste, the national waste, economic waste is beyond uh, comprehension. Now, in 1983, there are, there are, um, there was the Secretary of Education, um, can't remember his last name. He released a report which was titled The Nation at Risk. And they started, they, they started by saying, if a foreign nation does what we do to our students, our children, we will consider it as an act of war. Yes. That's a tough statement. But if we will consider it as act of war, how could we be doing our children what we consider to be act of war? I can't explain it, but it goes to the heart of inequity. And if you are poorly educated, your chances of getting a good job is, is bleak at best. And if you, even if you get a job, you're not going to make enough to do what you need to do. And then the tax base of the society is, is off-rooted. Mm -hmm. And people don't think you know, in a much broader way. The people you are, that are better educated generate a lot of money for the community, for the state, for the government, however they want to use it. So why wouldn't we look into the issue of education and consider that as uh, important? I, I looked at the, the, the message that was sent by the Fairfax County. Each, each step of the article, I kept thinking, what is going on? Why can't people think? I don't understand. It's, um, 
you know, and it's never stopping because there's no courageous people that could say, you know what, this is wrong. People tend to say, okay, my kids are okay. Like uh, Kuzo, he cited former Secretary of Education, um, Bennett, Bill Bennett, who said that in DC, he was outraged that people were talking about class size and they should be reduced. Well, he had his kids, according to Kuzo, in, in Virginia, and the highest number of people, number of people in that class was 14. And yet he was talking about 40 something in DC as not being enough that they could increase the it's hypocrisy. And I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain those type of things, but that's what we live with, you know. Well, you know, I, I think, and I'll, I'll put these links on, on the post, but there was a, an article that I read, um, and it was in a law review about how we do, we make this change incrementally. So we do do it. We have to do it on a federal level. So you think of the incremental change with legalization of marijuana. You think of the incremental change with states adopting um, the marriage equal rights to marriage act. So, so the, the person, the author who wrote this article argues that if we start doing it state by state, this incremental change in demanding that education is a fundamental and legal right, that it, it most, you know, we can get there because we've done it already. And I, I, I think um, this case really caught my, and you know this case, 2016, uh, Gary B versus Whitmer. This was the Detroit city schools, Detroit, Detroit public schools. And uh, the U.S. Uh, Sixth Court of Appeals found that the students that were, were plaintiffs were entitled to a basic minimum education. Um, and they argued that their 14th amend Amendment rights were violated because they received extremely inadequate education in comparison to other Michigan students. Uh, they had unqualified teachers, poor conditions within their classroom, inadequate teaching lessons, physically dangerous facilities, and insufficient materials. So um, the plaintiffs argued that their basic right to education was deprived when the school did not deliver them access to literacy. So they, they went through the 14th Amendment. Um, so how, knowing the 14th Amendment, do you think that this is something that other states could take a look at and um, parent groups or people who are interested in civil rights and making literacy or a, a education a fundamental right would use that avenue? I think that that's, that's correct. That's correct. But you know, when you are poor, it's kind of double whammy. The poor people are not the type that could go to court to seek, to seek you know, change. They are usually poor, they are usually intimidated, they are usually not able to articulate the position that those people may have articulated. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's the way it has, be, it has been for a while. But I do agree that if marijuana should go, and uh, now they're talking about people giving license to sell marijuana, which medically people say that is not very good for people to consume, and yet that is, is out. Now, marriage issue, that one is out. Um, I think the minimum people could do is to start holding people accountable. I do believe that suing people under the 14th Amendment is, is correct. I would do, you know, the only reason why I was sort of uncertain about legality of it is because of some people who may not be able to, uh, to learn. And in that sort of situation, that could be uh, uh, you know, something that we could say, you can give, try to do the best one can do. But when it comes to blatant 
lack of access due to human creation, I think people should use legal tools to the best of their ability to remedy that thing. But I'm also saying that people should begin to hold those in leadership accountable because that's where it began. If a principal knows about science of teaching reading and that same principal will look the other way when the teachers are not operating based on those principles, um, then something is wrong. So in that situation, I would say they should go to however extent they can in order to, to deal with it. And I, as I looked at those things, I see the Hispanic, the African-American, and I also felt like there are some other segment of the population that we are not in that. Now, having been in West, Lib in West Liberty, or rather at West Liberty, having seen poverty, poverty among white people is devastating. So my view is that, the commonality, common thing here is poverty. Okay, then how could we do? What can we do to change that? Uh, you know, calculus, so that whether you are white, black, or poor, or whatever the color may be, that we should begin to figure out how do we use the science, what has been proven to be the most effective way of doing this to help students learn. Uh, I know that some people come with police whole language perspective, but there are still science that shows how you sound words, how you pronounce words, how you learn those skills that are very necessary in order to, you know, to bring them together. So it's, um, it's, it's a really, it's difficult one, yet simple. Simple in the sense that if they have a school superintendent, the school superintendent should rather than do what they had done before, where they will say, well, the president will come and say, well, I'm the educational president. Uh, let's, be, let's have educators who understood the science of reading. So when they get in that leadership, they should be able to lead in a way that is consistent with what we know about reading instruction and do it appropriately. If they don't, they should be held accountable because part of the issue is that people are not held accountable. I, I just, I just, sent, right. I just sent an article that they wanted me to write for a book that, that um, Cambridge is gonna be publishing. I think it, they say it's next month. Well. You know, if you if you really look at issue of equity and have people responsible doing the responsible thing, things will change. Now you go to some companies; they talk about diversity, diversity, diversity. The fact is that discrimination is ubiquitous, and those who are discriminated against often are people in less put powerful position. And those are people who may not have money to sue, to challenge based on violation of their, you know, those types of rules. So it's a, it's a tough situation. That's why I always push it back to leadership, accountability, establishing leadership, holding people accountable. You see things change. It's like if you drive a car and you go beyond certain speed, these are the consequences. People, when, at least when they come to a stop sign or, 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 or you know, this camera, they slow down. <laughs> so exactly. To, you know. I'm with you on that accountability measure. Mm -hmm. I was recently in Florida and I drove to Northern Florida. I, I, I flew into Southern Florida, drew, drove up to the Forgotten Coast, mm -hmm. which is Apalachicola, um, and in the northern part of the panhandle on the Gulf Coast. And I had a real education because I was shocked by the number of people living in poverty. And they are living in makeshift homes. And it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. 
Um, I met some of the people down there. They don't have what they need in their schools. They don't even have what they need for extracurricular because these are all white people who are desperately poor. So I love what you said, that poverty is the common denominator. Um, even the library, Dr. Moe, I took a picture and I'm gonna write an article about it. Um, you know, I live in near an urban area in Cleveland, Ohio, and we have a wonderful library system. Their library for this county was a trailer. And um, I just couldn't believe that in Florida, that this was a state that's part of our union and it looks so different from the urban area that I live in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, meeting some of the people down there. And by the way, I also, you know, you said good people are everywhere. I think because I live in an urban area, I have, you know, I don't know what people are like in other parts of our country. And everyone I met was really, really kind. These Southern people were very kind and, and very helpful to me while I stayed for three weeks. Um, but they don't have the same opportunity. Even the grocery store, you had, they had a Piggly Wiggly, which is the equivalent of a 7-Eleven down the street from me. But I would have to drive an hour and 15 minutes to get to a reasonable grocery store. So that's what really concerns me. And it was eye-opening to me because, uh, you know, I really thought it's really, you know, high poverty urban centers. And then I started doing some research on the rural areas. And some of these rural students are actually performing less well than their counterparts in high poverty urban areas. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think that people who look at race and use race to sustain division, mm -hmm. some of them are not aware or maybe they're aware. But for someone like me, I went my first school after getting my doctorate was at West Liberty uh, College, uh, now university. When I was in West Liberty, oh my God, I could not believe it. This is again, these are poor stricken environment. And I recall an article where they said that um, insurance companies are taking the walk to Durban because they don't find well-educated people to do some of the work they need to do. Mm -hmm. And yet they, 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 they don't realize that when that is happening, it, it, it touches the lifestyle of certain population. And again, uh, in the other one, they were looking at, you see that poverty, lack of health care, lack of our food, what they call food desert, and uh, lack of good nutrition, and pain and frustration of life resulting to so much like blood, pre blood pressure, hypertension, and all this um, untimely death of so many people stem from poverty. And when you are poor, the wagon circles around you, um, the chances of progress is limited. If you have kids, you can't train them. Their life by extension will be limited too. So it's the, it's, um, I, don't, I don't know if people have a, a political courage to do what is right. Um, unlike when I think I read about John Kennedy going to the Appalachian and uh, when he spoke, didn't know that the poverty was at the, the way they were. But in this day and age, who goes there? Now, election has begun. Guess what? People go to those states where they're going to be profiled and considered as uh, the, the, the person that is going to be able to go forward to the point that the, the states, the way they had carved the states, each state has supposed to have two senators, but these states are not valued as some other states that will give people leg up into that position. So what does that mean? It means that, that 
they are marginalized, even though they may have to, two senators and so on and so forth. So what we need is courageous people, people who believe in equity and social justice, not the way some people use it, but for all. And stay with that, focused on that. And anybody that deviates has to be punished with the greatest severity. And if they do that, uh, people, because it seems to me that what people fear is punishment. Mm -hmm. And ha, 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 find a way to, to punish those who violate opportunity or chance of opportunities for some, either through education or through other jobs and so on and so forth. But unfortunately, I'm not sure that people are serious about it. I know, and that's why, in my opinion, I feel that maybe litigation at the federal level might be the only way to get there because we have, you know, thousands of literacy groups working worldwide, mm -hmm. you know, in this country, thousands of literacy groups, and we haven't made great headway. Um, so, so for me, I, you know, I, I think I, most Americans probably don't know that education is not a fundamental right under the U.S. Constitution. And I hope that, we, I hope that people do the right thing. And you said early in this conversation, we cannot legislate morality. And that is true. So the call is to do the right thing. Okay, I'll give you the final word. I'm so honored that you joined me today and your experience and your work is uh, transformative in, in getting people to widen their perspective and see the world as it really is. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor for me to um, talk with you. And I think that uh, you are doing remarkable work. Uh, I have uh, a couple of people who are looking at education, especially with teaching, reading. I don't know if you know this. I think 30% of DC um, residents cannot read. And this is the capital, some people like to call it capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what we're gonna teach the world when the people at the, the, the national capital cannot read at that, at that level. It's, uh, it's just beyond comprehension. But um, again, thank you very much and continue the work. Uh, I think um, in terms of uh, using legal means to call people to attention, I would say whatever it takes, provided there's an exception for those who cannot cognitively are unable to do some of those things. But otherwise, I think that's the language people understand. And I think that's what um, could be done. And I would say, go at it from all fronts, state, federal, whichever way that could be, you know, we never know which one could work. Um, the civil union for uh, gay and lesbian uh, has, been, has been passed from the national um, side. So similar thing could pass from the national side. And if it goes that way, then we, it would uh, prevent us from this um, state rights that has created um, two sessions of a country where the discrimination is pervasive in one side of the society and the other side they may not be completely eradicated, but it's better than some other parts of the world. So I think whichever way it's gonna be done is something worthy of doing. Thank you. Thank you. Your, your words are absolutely um, rich and meaningful. So um, have a wonderful weekend. Well, you do the same. You do and the same. Thank you so much. And we'll talk again. All right. Thank you for having me, Mary. Have a good, a good weekend now. Okay? I, I most definitely will. Happy right. Sunday. Okay. Bye -bye.